Good morning, church family. I'm glad to be here with you to serve God and that you're here to glorify God and fellowship together. That's what we're here to do. And I'm thankful, Pastor and First Lady here to, to be with us today. Uh, we are, I guess, in the, I say, oh, oh, there she is, the daughter too. And, um, you know, we want, hopefully, more people are coming to here today. To, today is Hymn Sunday. You get to choose the hymns you want to sing. Number 10, Majesty. Number 10, Majesty. Can you come pray for us, brother? Our most gracious and dear Heavenly Father, we surely thank you, allowing us to come here one more time, my dear Lord, to glorify your holy name and the name of our Lord Jesus, our Savior, our Creator, our Redeemer. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Surely he is majesty. And uh, I know my dear Lord, no matter what I thought about his majesty, I will never reach in thinking the level he is in, my dear Lord. God the Son came as a man and lived among the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my dear Lord. And gave himself to die for a sinner like me. I thank you again, my dear Lord. And I thank you for your salvation is open to take care of all the world, my dear Lord. Whoever comes to you will be saved. Thank you for this. Thank you. We love you, my dear Lord. We praise your holy name. We want to live for you. I want, my dear Lord, to glorify your holy name in my things, in my thoughts, in my words, in my deeds, in everything I do, my dear Lord. And what I pray for myself, I ask the same for everyone of my brothers and sisters in this place, my dear Lord. Not only this place, because I know, my dear Lord, there is hundreds outside in other churches, my dear Lord, and you care about them as well. Thank you, thank you. None of these people, your Lord, have been missing from your memory, but you know everything about them and you want to bless them as you blessing us, my dear Lord. So thank you for this. We love to submit ourselves into your hands, my dear Lord. We love all to live for you and bring glory to your holy name. I want to pray, my dear Lord, especially for Akram. I, know, I don't know him, but I, his mother uh, believes of prayer, my dear Lord, and asked to pray for him. He has cancer. Lord, we submit him. In your hands, my dear Lord, Lord, your blessed hands is able to heal. You have done this many times, my dear Heavenly Father. 
the Lord Jesus Christ proved to all humanity that he is God, he is able to do everything. Thank you. I want to pray also for Darren. I, I understand, my dear Lord, he's still in the hospital from surgery to another surgery, my dear Lord. He is in your hands and you can use the doctors, my dear Lord, to direct uh, everything you want to be done to him, my dear Lord. Thank you, thank you. And I want to pray also, my dear Lord, for Lloyd. Help him, my dear Lord. Lloyd Patterson. He is in your hand also, my dear Lord. I pray that you would bless him. I know him, my dear Lord. A gentleman. But you know him better than me, my dear Lord. And uh, I pray that you would bless him. Lift him up, my dear Lord. And heal him from the trouble he has. Lord, we thank you. We thank you because we can come with our... Uh, a people whom we want you to touch their hearts, my dear Lord, and you never failed us. Uh, everyone here in this place, my dear Lord, has someone in his mind, and uh, me too, some others, my dear Lord, even they don't come to church here, but I pray that you would bless them, lift them up, my dear Lord, and encourage them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit will lead the, all the songs we are going to sing, my dear Lord, for the glory of Christ. And uh, your Holy Spirit will lead all prayers, my dear Lord, also. I am praying and uh, also my brothers and sisters are praying and you lead all these prayers. And I thank you because you answer them according to your perfect will. And also, my dear Lord, I want to pray for uh, Dr. Wadia when he comes here and speak your word, my dear Lord. We have been always blessed, uh, not be, uh, of him, but we are blessed, my dear Lord, for using him. You, my dear Heavenly Father, using him every time he speaks and you give him the words and you give him the ideas we, we really need, my dear Lord. Thank you for this. Keep the blessing, my dear Lord. We are expecting this every time we come here. Thank you. Thank you for answering the prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Tell all your neighbors. Thank you, my dear brother, for that prayer. Do you want to have a hymn? you want to sing? Three, five, three. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Three, five, three. Something we all need. Victory in Jesus. Three, five, three.
Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, open up the Word of God to the Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians 6, and we'll read from verse 1 to verse 10. If uh, you are able, let's uh, stand up and I invite you to read with me. Galatians 6, from 1 to 10. Brethren, is a, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, <clears throat> you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary. <clears throat> while doing good for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart therefore as we have opportunity let us do good to all especially to those who are of the household of faith let's pray father we thank you and we love you because of who you are it is so amazing when we are able to pause and to gaze at your goodness realizing your majesty realizing your authority realizing your your goodness realizing what you've done for us realizing how you see us and in light of all of that we become overwhelmed by your goodness and so we thank you for that and we thank you for bringing us here today and we pray that that we're not just here to check off a box that we went to church on Sunday, but that we are here encountering the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we thank you that we don't just come to praise you and glorify you and honor you, but you thank, we thank you for that throne of grace that we can enter in and, and come and also 
in addition to giving you our thanksgiving and our praise, that we can give, we can put our requests before you. Lord, I pray for Brother Akram that you would touch him in his illness and that you are you are able to, to be with him in the entire journey and to strengthen him. And you're also able to heal him, Lord. And so we put him in your hands and we put all the others that were mentioned. And also there are others who have requested, but and you know who they are and they didn't want to be mentioned my name, Lord. And so we pray for all those who are going through a tough time that you would strengthen them and uplift them. Lord, we pray that you continue ministering to us through the word as you have been through the songs and prayers. And I pray this in Jesus' name. You may be seated. What's on my heart for this small section, but I think it's very powerful, the title of the message is Help One Another. Help One Another. I think the way we are taught in society, it's very self-centered. It's all about, you know, helping me. We're all about me. And Christ is, is quite different than, uh, than what society teaches. And that's why his, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, for example, everything he said in there is radical. It is against human nature. It's against what we, what we lean toward. And in here, in this section, the Lord, through Paul, is speaking about helping one another. And there are two, from two verses, I'll draw the two things that we should be helping one another with. The first is in verse 2, it says, bear one another's burdens. And the first one is bearing. The second thing of how we can help one another is in verse 6, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And the second way we can help one another, not only do we bear each other's burdens, but the other one is also sharing with one another. And that is another form of help that we can do. So let's dive into these two sections of helping in, this, in scripture, the scripture that is before us. Galatians chapter 6. Now, obviously, just to state the obvious and make sure no one is, a, is asleep already. Um, it's too early. But uh, what do you guys think? Galatians chapter 6 comes after Galatians chapter? Only one person said Brother John, and now I'm mentioning you so you can capture the camera. <laughs> yes, you're right. After one, and then two, and then three. This is going to be a tough morning, huh? <laughs> I love it. Thank you, brother. So it comes after chapter five. Now, chapter five, he talks about two things, uh, and I'll just mention them briefly. And if you look at 519, it says, now the works of the flesh. So he takes an aspect of us that's bad and is evil, and it's the flesh, and the flesh has these works, and it does some disastrous things. And you can read them on your own from verse 19 to verse 21 of Galatians chapter 5. But then after that, he pivots and he talks about some, some powerful entity that's within us that we can have. And he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And he talks about nine things that have to do with the fruit of the Spirit that can happen within us, the fruits that comes out of us. And so he takes these two entities, the flesh and the spirit, and now he zooms in in chapter 6 and he says, I want you to know that there's a different approach when someone is hurting. There's a, the fleshly person is going to approach them very differently than a spiritual person. And he comes in chapter 6 verse 1, he says, brethren. And brethren is a term in the Bible, when we read it, it's talking to believers. So it's not male gender, it's Believers, male and female. If a man is overtaken in any trespass. And I love what he takes here. And he, the if could, be, could mean many different things. One of them is a hypothetical example. And some is if meaning since. That's sometimes in scripture. In here in the context, he's talking about a hypothetical example. He says, if a man, so he take, thinks of this guy, is overtaken in any trespass. Trespass, And I love the word overtaken because the word overtaken here in the Greek is carrying the meaning of that this is accidental. This is not deliberate. This is just happened. It's someone stumbled rather than someone who's doing something that is habitual. 
You guys know the difference between habitual and something that is just overtaken, something that happens once? Habitual means what? Something they what? that a person what? Does all the time, over and over and over, no matter what you, let's say someone is a liar, no matter what you do with them, they're always going to what? Lie. And then eventually, what? you just don't trust anything that they say. If you guys ever heard of the term, someone who cries wolf, you know what that means? That person is a liar. And so when the actual wolf is there, no one is going to be there to help them out because you don't believe them because they cry wolf all the time. And you guys, I'm sure, know the story behind it. And so here he's saying, listen, I want you to know that the first attitude, well, first, you know, we shouldn't be habitually living in sin. But also, if you, you and I are spiritual, when we look at somebody else, how do you look at them? Have you ever seen people that have really high standards for others? Right? I hold others to high standards. And then when it comes to holding myself to my standards, what happens suddenly? I lower the bar because I make it easier on me to do my thing. And he says, that's a carnal person. That's a fleshly person. But as, and they always say they blame somebody else. Like let's say they did something wrong, and they always what, point the finger. Hey, it's because of you. I'm like, how did I? How did I bring? How did you bring me into this thing that is happening? However, a believer holds himself to a high standard and takes it easy on others. And the reason they hold themselves to a high standard is not because of arrogance or pride. It's because they know that they fall short, and they want to use that to be able to help others. The first. Thing that I want to challenge us with this morning and the scriptures challenging us with when someone sins how do we look at them do we look at them as a loser or do we look at them as someone that just fell there's a big difference in the way we look at them. one of them is just like oh you are just always a loser and the other one is you know what you tripped up I could have, you know, not, not noticed that wire and I could have tripped up myself. And that's the first thing that is a spiritual person, a person who is godly, how they see someone who sins. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, and so here he's saying this guy happened to, to stumble and in this hypothetical example, and he, he fell into this sin. And then it doesn't say, you who are the pastors, but it says, you who are what? Spiritual. Spiritual. I want to call on every single believer, but not all of them, only the ones that are spiritual. Because there are there believers who are carnal or fleshly or not? Yeah, and I, unfortunately, there's probably a good percentage of those. It says, you don't come near this person. But if you are a person who is a believer who is a spiritual believer, this is not the pastor's job, this is your job. Including, hopefully, pastors are also spiritual, and if they're not, they probably should just retire or quit what they're doing. You who are spiritual, restore. So we see seen the first word that we need to, to hold on to is the word overtaken, okay? So don't look at that person, look, don't look down on that person, but look at them as someone that you want to be there for and help. Second word we need to hold on to is the word spiritual. We need to have the fruit of the Spirit in us that is, was spoken about in Galatians 5 from verse 22 to the end. You who are spiritual, and the third word we need to hold on to is the word restore. I want you to go as you approach this person who messed up, they are absolutely in the wrong. It's not somebody else's fault. They are the ones that messed up. And I want you to go with an outcome that you want what? Restoration. Because, you know, have you ever you've seen people that wing it and then it just turns out really bad sometimes? Sometimes it, it's okay, but sometimes things turn out really bad. But have you ever gotten into a conversation and you're like, ooh, this went worse than I thought? It happens. And have you ever, have, have you ever been in some conversation like, wow, that turned out much better than I thought? Those happen too. And it has intentionality of what you want as the outcome, then what? that's how you and I show up in that thing. Like let's say, you know, you go to somebody, and I, I remember growing up, sometimes this would happen. You go up to somebody, you're like, hey, are you like dumb or dumb? Is that gonna be a good outcome? It's like, there's, you didn't give me a way out. It's like, I don't like option A or B. Is there an option C? 
And that's not going to be a really good outcome. So here he says, listen, I want you to have the outcome be restored. Now the beauty of the word restore is what it also means in the Greek. So the word overtaken, it's accidental, it's not habitual. But the word restore in the Greek talks about someone with a broken bone that's displaced. Raise your hand if you ever had a fracture. Any kind of fracture. Raise your hand if it hurt. It hurts. I'll tell you, in the pandemic, uh, you know, they shut down the gyms. And so I decided, you know what, I want to work out still, and I can't go to a gym. So I would, uh, we live in a place where there's a lot of hills, so I would started running. And I said, no, it's a lot easier to run down than to run up. So I would walk up and run down. So after a while, I was like, why am I limping? I have so much pain. And after one or two months, I ended up saying, you know, I have health care. Why don't I call my doctor? And I called him after being in pain for one or two months and limping. And just like when I see patients, they're like, are you okay, doc? Do you need some help? I went to my doctor and it turned out I had stress fractures right below both my knees from, you know, running downward. And that was not a, that was not a good thing. It hurt. It hurt really bad. Now, it wasn't displaced, though. So it was a hairline fracture. Now, if you have a, a fracture that is displaced, do you guys know what is needed to be done? Huh? Reset it. Put it back. Yeah. You, so before the cast, you got to put it back into place, and then you put a cast on it. What is it that caused... Are bones pretty strong, by the way, or not? Yeah, God knows what He's doing when He made us. Bones are strong. But it took something that is such a strong pressure that it what? It broke that bone. And it was so strong that it wasn't a hairline fracture like the one I had, but it what? It displaced it. Now, can you say, you know what? I'm sick of this piece of bone. Let's just take it out. Is that a good idea? No, I mean, if it's shattered and you can't do anything about it, that's a different story. But if it's, you know, went like that. And I've seen some horror stories, and I, so you guys don't get queasy. I won't share with you some of them. So what do you want to do? You want to reset it into place. And then what do you need to do? You put a cast. Why are you putting a cast on it? Because you don't want it to displace again. There's a time of you need to hover around this thing, protect it from any external pressure so it doesn't want to break again. Let's now come back to our section. When a believer messes up, and I'm not talking about winning the lost, that is critical and important. I'm talking about winning the believers when a believer is out of place when they mess up they're hurting it's painful but also what guess what they're still part of what the rest of the bone which is us as the body of Christ sometimes we think like you know what less is more just just, just get out of here move go to another church and he's saying, no, 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 I need you to know that that, part, that person is a part of your body. We need to reset them back into place. And I want you to know that they're hurting and so are you. And you should be hurting for them because you love them. And then after you reset them, I want you to know they're a very fragile stage right now for a temporary period of time. For most fractures, it's six weeks. In that time, you need to not just reset them because they'll go right back. You need to come and surround them. You need to be right here for them. And he says, listen, I want you to know if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. You have only one outcome in mind, and that is you want that person to come back to Christ. You want them to be strong in the Lord again because the body's broken without them. You and I are in need of them just like they are right. They are in that time in such dire need for us who are spiritual. I want you to have an outcome of restore. When was the last time you and I had a tough conversation with someone? And the purpose was, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. How about you replay that and say, I'm going to have a tough conversation with that person with the purpose of tough love. Because sometimes you have to have a tough conversation, tough love. 
It's not like, oh, it's okay what you did. That is not true. They messed up. But how do we be there for them? Ephesians, right? Chapter 4, verse 15, I believe. Speaking the truth in love. Does truth hurt sometimes? Yeah, it hurts a lot. But when you say it in love, guess what? You have salve on it. It is healing. I want you to restore such a one. Oh Lord, help us stop speaking our minds and start speaking your truth in love. And how, here's how I want you to, so I want you to approach this person not looking down on them, but they are overtaken. Second is I want you to know that they're broken and they're a piece of you. I want you to restore them. I need you to surround them. I need you to be there for them. And I want you to do that here in this manner. First, I want you to do it in a spirit of gentleness. I don't know if this ever happened to you, but sometimes, you know, we're upset. Right? I'm not going to ask. You know, have you ever been upset? Because if you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> but, so I won't put anyone in that, in that position. Or you're asleep. That is another possibility for sure. But, you know, sometimes we say things and we wish we didn't, right? When we're upset. And sometimes we actually hold back. And we take... The time is needed, right? For some people, it's just a moment. Some people need a week or whatever, how long to cool down. And then they go and address it. So they don't dodge it, but they go address the issue and the outcome is much better. It's very different. And that's what's the difference is one is just heated and they're fiery and man, it comes out some bad stuff. The other one is what? There's this gentleness that comes when, okay, I want to restore how do I work with this person in a way that leads to a good outcome? And so I come with a gentle attitude. And so that's the first thing is watch the spirit that you're going in. The type of spirit that you're talking with. And he says, you, not just you are spiritual, but also restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Be gentle. Now imagine, you know, I've, I've seen people with broken bones. I've tried, I've reset a few through my training. I'm not an orthopedist, I'm a family doctor, but I've reset a few throughout my training. And you know, when you come near that broken area, and if the person, you know, they're usually awake, right? And you come near, like, oh, no, oh, gentle doc, take it easy, you know, don't, don't go. And you have, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt bad. Sometimes you numb it, sometimes it's the numbing, it hurts just as much, you just gotta go, just be really, but you got to just be gentle in what you do because it hurts. So restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. And he says, so I want you to have an outcome of restoration, but also I want you to know that as you're approaching this person, I need you to be gentle. Why should I be gentle? He says, because hold up. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Stop being one of those people that says, oh, I would never do that. Oh, I would never lie. Oh, I'd never commit sexual immorality. Oh, I, I'd never do drugs. Oh, I'd never, I'd never, I'd never. You know, I recall a man after God's own heart. You guys know who that is in scripture? David. And who said he's a man after God's own heart? God himself. And after he had said that, David committed adultery. David lied David murdered one of his best friends by the way he says listen I need you to when you go one thing that will help you be gentle with people is you're not above that sin 
to imagine you go to somebody and be like, you know what, I know you're struggling with this thing and I am a sinner saved by grace. I'm no better than you. I could fall into that. But you know what? God has helped me in this way. Let me come along and be there for you. And wow, you turn to somebody who now you reflect a mirror on them. They see their fault, but they don't see what? That they're a loser. But you're seeing them and addressing them like how Christ sees them. You guys remember the when Christ was sharing that there was this plant that wasn't bringing fruit. And it's been three years and the, the, the person said, hey, enough. That this thing is taking up space. Just remove it. And what did he say? He says, just please leave it this year also. Just one more year. And you know what? As if it's his fault. And by the way, who's that person? That's Jesus. As if it's his fault, he says, just let me, let me dig around it. Let me, let me fertilize it. Let me water it some more. And he has nothing to, there's nothing to blame on him. And all oh, that we come to people and say, hey, no, I'm not going to water down what you've done. You know who did a really good restoration? Joseph with his brothers. They came up to him and they tried to kind of pull one on him after their dad died. They said, you know, so Joseph, you know, it happened to be this thing, you know, dad before he died. Because he can't verify because his dad is dead. Before he died, he said, you know, your brothers, take care of them. And they kind of tried to water it down. And then he says, no, 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 let's, let's just reflect here. He says, what well, you did, you meant it for this is Genesis 50, and I believe verse 20 says, You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. He didn't water down their sin. He says, No, nah, your intent was evil, and what you did was evil. But God. And so, you know, here's what I'm going to do. I'm here to restore our relationship. I want you to know that I'm going to love you. And I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to love your kids. I'm going to take care of your kids. You guys don't have to do nothing. I'm second in command in Egypt, in the richest country in the world at that time. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your children. But I want you to know that, that don't lie. Don't continue in sin. Don't water it down. Just be corrected. And I want you to know from my end, we're good. I'm just going to, you did me wrong, but that's okay. God had a better plan with that. And so I'm going to love you. And I'm going to love your kids. I'm going to love your offspring. And I will be there for you. And so here he says, I want you to restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. None of us are better. None of us are bigger than the sin that our brother just fell in or struggled in. And then comes our word. He says, bear one another's burdens. So we've seen that as we want the outcome to be restoration, we do it in a way of gentleness. Why? Because we are not immune from sinning and even sinning in that particular sin. But then the second thing he says, I want you to bear one another's burdens. Now, imagine this. To bear one another's burden. So what does that mean? That they're dealing with something that is hard, heavy, right? So in just general, like physical terms. So let's say, you know, who here thinks that they can, you know, lift some pretty heavy stuff? Any people? Anyone does benching, you know? So I used to be like, go benching, and then I look at the people, I'm like, I'm not benching, this looks terrible. They have like plates of 45s. I'm like, you put one on one, I'm already like, that's a lot. The bar is 45, and then 40, that's not a lot, but a lot for me. So it's kind of embarrassing. But even if you take someone who like, you know, can bench 300 pounds, can they just by themselves carry a couch? No, even though the couch is less than 300 pounds. But why can't they? It's too bulky. It's big. It's not a job of one person. So what do you need? Somebody else to help you out. And here he's saying, I want you to know that some burdens are heavy. And in order for someone to carry that burden, they can't do it on their own. So therefore, they need what? 
and help. They need at least one more person to come and help them carry that. So now, what, he, what is he trying to say here? He says, not only I want you to have a spirit of gentleness, but I need you to what? Be close. Imagine, you know, Brother Chris in the back right there, he wants to carry a couch and I want to help him out. Can I help him from over here? That's got to be a massively big couch in order for us to carry it together. You can't do that. That means what? Hey, don't be one of those, you know, have you ever seen those people that sit there on the sideline and say, oh, that's going to hurt. Ooh, watch your back. Bend your knees. Straight back. Oh, yeah, you're so helpful. And there's some people like that. They love to criticize. Like, oh, if I was there, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have been this mess. I wouldn't have. Stop. Stop talking about it and go help. Drop what you're doing. Go there and help that person who's in need right now. They have a heavy burden. You're going to see them break under your load rather than getting out your camera. Right? People love to capture stuff on camera because it might go on the news. It might go viral. And the person crumbles and you're like, you know what? We should put that on America's Funniest Videos. Really, when the person just got hurt in front of you and you're sitting there laughing at them, you could have been there and that could have been a different outcome because they wouldn't have fallen under the burden, the heavy burden that they were carrying. Go help a brother out. But we love to criticize. You ever seen people that sit there and they say, Ah, oh, yeah, unorganized. Inefficient. And they just like destroy whatever is happening. They're like, oh, did you sign up to be part of the planning? No. Well, you seem to not like anything. Why don't you be part of the planning? And then now when it's your turn, you're like, oh, this is much harder than I thought. He says, hey, I need you to do this. Bear one another's burdens. Don't stand on the sideline. Don't stand far. Go there and help someone out. Go there and be close to help. And what do you do? So first, you do gentleness because what you could fall into that. But why should I go there and actually lift, which takes effort on my end, right? Because if they're hurting, that means what? Well, I'm going to be hurting too. If it's that heavy, if it's that bulky, if it's that difficult, it's going to be what? It's going to be easier, but still what? A burden on both of us or maybe multiple of us. So go get close and be willing to put effort, be willing to suffer with them, be willing to be hurting with them, be willing to go through it with them. Why should I do that? And so fulfill the law of Christ. Fulfill the law of Christ. If you go to the Gospel of John chapter 13, if you go to the Gospel of John chapter 15, the Lord Jesus Christ says, a new commandment I give to you that you shall what? Love. What? Love who? Love God? Love one another. And then he qualifies, he says, just like what? As I have loved you. Now what do you guys think of, if you say love one another, you're like, oh love, let me give you a hug. That's our interpretation of love. And that could be one form of hug, of, of love, that we hug one another. Embracing and just when someone is in need, sometimes a hug is so powerful. What did Christ do? How did he demonstrate his love for us? He what? He died. Oh, that's a little bit. That's hard. He says, love one another as I have loved you. Greater one, there's no greater love than for one to what? Give up themselves or their friends. And are we his friends? We were his enemies when he died for us. He says, I want you to love one another just like I have loved you. You were not worthy of any love, yet I've loved you. And you don't want to do that to somebody else. You don't want to break a sweat. You don't want to hurt. Oh, you know, I got a back condition. <laughs> Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is the law of love. But the law of Christ also, uh, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Who has, the love of Christ has been poured in us by the Holy Spirit. So not only does he say, love one another as I've loved you, but I also uh, empowered you 
I didn't put you in a place of disadvantage. I've actually given my, I've poured my love within you. You are able to do this. The next thing in verse 3 says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something, and there is this group of people that everyone's like, oh, I'm something. You're nothing. Or if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. What is he talking about here? So first he talks about, we, this person messed up. It's for real. Go restore them. But make sure you're gentle because you could fall into the same sin. And also, make sure that you are there to get close enough and bear with them that burden. Why? Because you love them. You have the love of Christ. Then he says, I want you to also know another important fact is that this is not graded on a curve. We're spoiled here in America by being graded on a curve many times. In many colleges and many things, we are graded on a curve. I don't believe, I mean, I only was in Egypt till the end of seventh grade. I don't recall that we were ever graded on a curve. And maybe they do it over there. So he's saying, you know, some people have this thing like, well, you know, as long as we don't get, as long as we get graded on a curve, if everyone else is terrible and I'm just like, you know, less terrible than what, like, I have a chance. You know, I had, I remember one time I took this chemistry test and something was wrong with that professor. No disrespect to any, you know, teachers in here, but this guy, you know, he was sitting there and I looked at the test and I was like, what is this? This is a final exam. I was like, I'm totally going to fail this thing. I, I don't recognize anything. I was like, I thought I studied hard and I thought I studied all the material. And he, and then I just kind of like look up and then and he's like, <laughs> you know, like, I thought, what's wrong with this guy? This guy's sick, you know? And so after I finished, I turned it in. And I'm like upset, you know, it's like, he's like, what do you think? And I'm like, this is hard. And I was like one of the kind of the top students in the class. And he was like, this is hard, I failed. And he's like, I know. And I was like, why are you laughing? He's like, because everyone fails this test. I created on a curve. I created on a curve. And I did, you know, by percentage I failed. But then I ended up being an A because it's on a curve. That's not how it works with God. Well, you know, you committed murder. I only give a white lie. Like, what's a white lie? It's still a lie. You committed adultery. I only lost it. I didn't do the act. I was just thinking it. You smoked, but I didn't inhale. Never mind. <laughs> just to wake you guys up. I'm going to get in trouble. It's not on a curve. It's not on a curve. God's standard, God is holy. God is holy. And we fall short. He says, hey, doesn't matter. Don't get, don't feel that you're safe because you think you're something when you really fall short. You're deceiving yourself. I don't look at you next to others. I look at you by yourself alone. But let each one examine his own work. I need you to, to focus on yourself. I, mean, I need you to do a self-assessment. I need you to really look at and examine your life. But let each one, so here he goes from what? Individual, he talks about individual. Let each one examine his own work, not somebody else's. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone. God is going to look and say, hey, were you really, was your motive pure when you did this one thing? And did you do it from your heart? Did you do it unto the Lord? And when you mess up, did you come back as quickly as you realized and you were repentant with genuine repentance before the Lord? You know what that's called? Blameless in God's sight. Then you can have what? Rejoicing in Himself alone because we're not going to be perfect. But God's perfection is that when we mess up, we run quickly back to Him and, and, and repent. And not in another. Don't be one of those people who take pleasures like, oh yeah, that guy fell again. <laughs> I'm looking pretty good today. Don't do that. 
It is not a competition. And then he takes us to verse 5 and he says, For each one shall bear his own load. What? I think there's a contradiction. Look at verse 2, look at verse 5. I thought we bear one another's burdens, right? Isn't that what it says in verse 2? Bear one another's burdens. And then verse 5, For each one shall bear his own load. Do you guys think the Bible contradicts itself? No, absolutely not. You wouldn't be here if you thought that. But for those who may be watching who thinks that the Bible contradicts itself, you have to go to the Greek to understand. There's two different words for the burden that's being carried here. In verse 2 talks about, bless you, in verse 2 talks about a heavy burden that no one person can carry. This one, let each one come and bear the burden with one another. In verse 5, he's talking about your own backpack, like a soldier carrying their backpack with its goods. Guess what? It's heavy. But everything in there is what? Critical and absolutely important, especially if you're in war. Especially if you're in desert, especially if you have nothing. This is your survival of what you've got. And what he's saying is that when we stand before God, we're all going to stand alone. No one is going to be there to spot us. But when we're here on the earth, there are certain things that we need to help one another. The example of the couch. If we want to move a couch in our house, guess what? All four of us might come together and we'll be much more successful than one person. Especially if you're going to take something, if you have a two-story or whatever, if you live upstairs, that's much how you need some people with that, to help you out with that. But between my wife and I, we can do parenting. But there are unique things that she can do as a mom that I can't. And there are certain unique things that I can do with the kids that as a dad that she cannot. That's bear your own burden. Are you and I, do we take that responsibility and take it to heart and say, Lord, I'm going to be accountable to you. And so therefore, I'm going to carry that burden and do it well. I'm going to do it unto the Lord. For each one shall bear his own load. The first way to help one another is bear one another's burdens. Come close and be there to help lift up with somebody else. The second has to do with sharing. Let him who is taught the word, so he talks about someone who comes to church and they are receiving, they're being taught the word. Share in all good things with him who teaches. So we're talking about the one, the pastor or the teacher who's teaching the word of God. He's talking about spiritual things in the house of God. So he's talking about the person who receives, let him who is taught the word on the receiving end, share in all good things with him who teaches. So share with the person who teaches. Sometimes we, we love to be those who are in the pews. And that's it. He's saying, no, you're not here to just be an observer. You're here to what? Contribute. You're here to share. And what does it say, share what? Is it, what is the word that's saying, share what? Does it say share money? It says share in all good things. You know what that means? Is money included? Yeah, but it's all good things. You know what that means? It means that, you know, have you ever seen people like, you know, it's your job. It's your job, pastor. So, you know, do the spirit, do your thing, you know. Make sure it's not boring. Make sure you don't take long. <laughs> and then after, you know, the meeting is done, like, good job, pastor. And then that's it. That's a contribution. No, it's a good to encourage, okay. But there are those who are very invested. They say... 10% of churchgoers are the ones who do the work. There's 100%. What happened to the 90? No, I love to come. I love a good meeting. Some good songs, some good prayer, good message. How about you share? Do you ever pray for people who do God's work? Do you ever, you know, I know like Pastor Greg Glory, I mean, that guy has a vision reaching not just his church or two churches that he or three churches, one the two here and the one in Hawaii, 
He has a vision for California. He has a vision for America. He has a vision for the world. So you may not attend his church, but pray for him. That's pretty powerful. And it's a heart for people, a heart for the lost. Sharing all good things with him who teaches. And what's he trying to say here? He's saying, listen, we put our prioritization sometimes is a bit on the off side. So there's some spiritual treasures, right? And there's some monetary treasures that we have, right? So, so each, each one of us has, you know, money. Each one of us has a place that we, a roof, right? So that's worth something. Each one of us has health. Each one of us has energy. Each one of us has a lot of things and some have more than others. And the way we prioritize these things is the spiritual treasures in our mind and in a, in a church setting, it's like, oh, that's the top. But now, hold up, let's look at your choices and my choices and see, does it really come up to the top or not by our actions or not? And what we really do is what we prioritize. Again, it's not about others, it's about ourselves. So people, some people, they're obsessed with what? They're obsessed with their health. So they're always you know, focused on their eating, focused on their, you know, uh, exercising and all great things. But that's like their, their main focus. And then if there's any leftover, they might throw something toward God. I'll do something for you, Lord. Some people are obsessed about other worldly things. And so here he says in verse 7, do not be deceived. I don't want you to be fooled. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Okay? We can't pull one on God. For whoever, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And here, I want you to understand something. When you contribute, now by the way, I'm, I don't want money. <laughs> just so it's clear. We should take care of pastors, just not me. Take care of somebody else from a from a financial perspective. The Lord has blessed our family, and I am not called to be. Uh, I'm. I feel that my calling is to be similar to Paul. Nothing compared to Paul, but to be similar to Paul to have tent making, and that I'm blessed with. But I'm talking about the concept here of prioritizing spirituality. So just nobody's mind goes in the wrong direction. And we need to honor God's people. So if someone, their whole you know, income is from the ministry, we need to take care of them. But that's not the case for me. So he says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Not only I want you to, to help those who share the word of God, because they they deal with a big burden, right? A lot of people go and, and have issues and problems and they talk to them. But also a lot of people are there to what? To attack. To attack the gospel and the word of God. There's not, not everybody's a believer out there. And things are getting tougher and tougher in America when you talk about things that have to do with the Word. He says, I want you to know that not only that is important, but I want you to understand another concept that's about you and a blessing for you as the person who's a believer who wants to just come and be in the pew and split, take off right after, dip is the word I think that people use nowadays. No, no, I need you to, I need you to be more of a contributor than that. What I need you to do is I want you to understand the blessing it is to you. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. I want you to understand that what you sow is important. Not only just sowing is important, but what you sow is important. So for example, if you take a mango seed, I'll just take it because that's you know one that it only has one seed in, in, inside of it. If you take a mango seed and you plant it, what's the most outcome that you can get out of that? A tree. What kind of tree? Mango. A mango tree. Can you get multiple trees? No, you can, the maximum you can get what is one mango tree. Could you plant a mango seed and then you say, you know, two years later, I heard that it takes five years, I could be wrong on this, but I heard it takes five years for mangoes to come out. Two years later you think, you know, what I really love. It would be really cool if lemons come out of this thing. 
Is that, is that possible? No, the deed is done. You already put that seed, and it was what? A mango seed. You can only get about what? A mango. Now, the other thing, when you put a mango seed, you get a one mango. So we're just talking here. One mango seed gets you what? One mango. Assuming it's successful, it may not, it, nothing may happen, but let's say it happens. You get one mango tree. How many mangoes come out of that tree? A lot. You don't get one mango. You get mangoes. And then season after season after season, it's mangoes. What's he saying? It's like, believers, stop being all about you. Contribute to the work of God because what you are contributing, and I'm not talking just financially because we have a lot more to give than financial. I'm talking about if there's a need in the church, you know who needs to fill that need? Us, not somebody else. Step up and do it unto the Lord. Guess what happens? There's a ton of blessing that you receive. You planted one seed and you get what? Yeah, one tree. But fruit after fruit after fruit, it becomes a lot. The person who receives the most is you and I when we contribute to the work of the Lord. The other thing that I, he says I need you to understand, and I'm just paraphrasing and I'm going to go very fast through it. So mango will only get you mango. You're not going to get oranges or lemon or whatever. But also one seed gets you one tree, but that tree brings you a lot of fruit. Now imagine if you really love mangoes and you'd like to be in the business of mangoes. Do you think it's wise to just get one mango tree and plant it, assuming you have a big field? What do you want to do? A lot of seeds. Guess what? You have potential for a lot of trees, and each tree gets you a lot of mangoes. Then it, what? it becomes much more explosive. I recall a story from, uh, I believe it's Billy Graham. And I believe his wife's name is Ruth. And so one time they were collecting the offering and I think he had a 20 and $100 bill in his pocket. And so he wanted to give the 20. And so he put his hand in his pocket, but you know, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And so he was, he was a great man, man of God. He's with the Lord now. And we were, when we were in North Carolina, it was moving. We went into his, um, the Billy Graham Library Museum, or, and we went to his house, and we saw his, his actual house there. It's so moving. You just feel like you want to give your life to Christ, even though you're a believer, and you want to feel like you want to pray at the end. It's very amazing. So anyway, so he ended up giving by mistake, the hundred rather than the twenty. And so he tells his wife, Ruth, he says, hey. And by the way, both of them are buried there in that, in that same area. And we saw their, their grave. He said, Ruth, you know, God is good. He's going to bless me. I wanted to give the twenty, but I gave the hundred. So Ruth said to him, you know, Billy, you know, God's going to give you credit for the 20 because <laughs> that was was in your heart and you're like, you're right. <laughs> Why do I say this? Because we are sometimes like, Okay, I mean, someone can get that. Talk about times like me time. Mm -hmm. Where's the Lord's time? Well, you know, when I go to school and go to work and, you know, watch my TikTok and get on, you know, caught up on my show, binge watch and... I'm exhausted. I mean, I gotta respect the Lord. I'm so exhausted. I'm not gonna read the Word of Scripture when I'm gonna be falling asleep. So tomorrow I'll do better. And then a month passes by. You'd be like, "Where's your Bible?" Oh, I don't know. Let me. Oh, what's all this dust on it? Because I haven't touched it. 
But boy, you touched everything else. And you gave it the me time, lots of time. Wellness. I don't want to get burned out. We do everything but the Lord's stuff. Don't tell me the Lord is first in your life. Our actions are stating otherwise. By what we choose, we do with our material possessions. By what we choose to do with our time. And we wonder, look at the next part. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will reap also for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. If we plant fig, we will only get fig. I wonder, why am I not growing in God? Well, what are you doing to grow in God? Nothing. You're, of course you're not going to grow. It doesn't happen automatic. Well, Lord, may you do this in my life. No, when you pray that once a month, and you're half asleep, and you do nothing about it, nothing's going to happen. He says, what? Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. James, right? Who's starting? You and I. Need to show him that we mean business. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Don't be surprised at the outcome that we get, why it is that we nothing happens. We look year after year, every New Year's Eve, we make all these promises, and then the next year flips, and then we come to the end of it, we look back, we're like, yeah, I did none of those things. And I'm still the same person, because I'm going to continue to get the same outcome when I continue to what? plant the same seed. You and what you have and what you possess from energy, from strength, from power, from material, from all these things, those are seeds. Have you been investing them lately? But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There are those people that just like go from leaping from one place to the next, doing amazing things, always growing. You're like, man, there's always something new. Every year we talk, there's been some activity. God has been moving in your life. You see, they reap what? everlasting life not only eternal life when they leave here and they close their eyes but it's starting here they have one blessing after the next after the next after the next that they are here and let us not grow weary while doing good he says yeah, i know it's hard because when you do good and when you're sharing with others when you're bearing burden with others guess what that's hard he says so i want you to not grow weary and you know why we grow weary because we're using the wrong source for energy, the wrong source for strength. We are doing it on our own. Lean on Him. Lean on the Lord. Be strengthened in the Lord. Spend time with Him. Of course we have no energy. When was the last time you read in the Bible? I don't know. Well, of course you have no energy because you don't eat. Guess what? To have energy, what? We all need to eat. You guys remember Saul when he was fighting and then he says, No one eat. You're fighting war. You know, it's not buttons. It's not like nuclear <laughs> You know, things, are, you know, it's not like that. You're still a sword, the person in front of you. You need to have energy. Guess what happened? His son, Jonathan, took some money. He's like, wow. Ooh. And he was like the energizer bunny, and he was one of them, able to win the war. We need to eat. Do you eat? Oh, yeah, I eat. No, I'm talking about another type of food. Do you read in the scripture? Do you reflect? What is that called? Prayer. That's called now allowing it not to just come and leave. But allow him to come, and I meditate on it, and then I respond to it. Do you rest? Do you go to church? Because we find rest in his presence with God's people. That's why we, we become weary. We get tired, because we are not taking care of ourselves. While you do good, while doing good, for in due season, the tree, the mango tree doesn't come out the moment you plant that seed. You have to wait. You have to be patient. So if you've been reaching out with somebody like, oh, they're a lost cause, please, they're still alive, they're not. Keep sharing with them about God. Keep loving them. Keep watering. Keep going. If a man is overtaken, remember, restore. Let's go that way with that approach. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Don't give up. And then he ends with this, and I'm going fast because I want to end. Therefore, so now we know all this. As we have opportunity. Every opportunity we get, that's it. We either act or not. 
we might not get that same opportunity again. So every opportunity is a chance. As we have opportunity, let us do good to what? All. Everybody. So don't pick and choose. But do good to what? To everybody. And what happens? The fruit comes what? Later. Comes later. Do it now. Do it for God's glory. To honor Him. And that's it. Let us do good to all. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now when it comes to believers. Don't neglect them. Prioritize them. You also don't be one of those cliques where you only help believers and you forget about everybody else. And sometimes even among believers in the same church, you have your click and the non-click. Do good to all. Help one another. Have you and I been doing our part? How do you and I see someone who has sinned? Do we look down on them like a carnal believer would? Or do we come and say, no, no, that looks heavy. Let me come and help you out. Let me come and bear that with you and shoulder it with you for the honor of the Lord. And then how about with the, what God has blessed you? How much of that have you invested for His glory? To honor Him? Or is He an afterthought? Is He when there's leftovers? When there's, okay, I have nothing else to do, so okay, I'll do something for the Lord. I pray that the Lord has moved our hearts and is moving. I know He's moving in our midst, but I hope that He'll move our hearts that we would act quickly and not let any opportunity go by without doing good, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Open time of prayer. Invite as many people that would like to pray out loud. Be an encouragement to those around you to pray out loud.